listen only mode. Hey everybody, it is Harlan Kilstein here and we are very fortunate that on the line we have the marketing rebel himself, John Calton. Now, John is probably um, in the, the top level of what they call, actually John called it himself, the A-list of copywriters. He, he probably made the term up just so he can include himself on the list. And um, <laughs> he, he has written for, uh, he, he has spanned from the biggest publishers in the world to um, having ghost written for some of the biggest names in copywriter to the in copywriters to the point where his style um, gets shot out shout outs from people like Gary Bensavenga who uh, you know called out about John's style at his um, uh, Bensavenga 500 um, uh, shindig and people know that uh, John's one of the certainly one of the best copywriters alive. It's, uh, he, I'm very fortunate that he's spending some time with us today. And the question that I have for you, and we're going to launch off this, is why is it that copy, that regular folks write, most of that copy typically sucks? What do you, what do you think is 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 you know and, and 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 people don't typically have a clue as to what to do about it. So let's start with what 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 is what's missing from from the typical copy. Well, uh, first, hello Harlan. I hope you're feeling well. Um, always good to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for the kind words too. That's uh, always uh, uh, humbling to hear. Uh, how people regard my stuff. I've thrown myself into writing my entire career going over 35 years now. It's it's my heart and soul and it's something I hold very dear and it's why my second career as a as a teacher is coaching and mentoring and helping other people learn to write is so important to me. It's not something I just did because there's money in it. There isn't a lot of money in it actually. But uh, it's something I just had to do. I, it was partly paying back to the industry that saved my life back when I was sleeping on couches and living out of my car and decided to become a freelance writer and the long struggle without any help at all. And finally, I figured it out. And I vowed to the universe, if I ever did figure this out, I was going to help other people. And this is part of that. You, by the way, uh, of course, you're not shy in telling people that you were one of my best students. Or, uh, or one of my worst, or worst students, depending on. Well, yeah, you you killed the you killed the freelance uh, model I had. I had a, a coaching model where I had open uh, contact with me through email and I believe several phone calls. And Harlan is the only guy of the hundreds who got into it that actually took me up on that. Emailed me multiple times every day. Just would not let it go until I gave him the uh, coaching he wanted. And I think you also have a visceral understanding of, of going from writing bad copy to writing good copy. It's, it's, it's a natural process. Nobody's born, you know, they, they, they talk about natural salesmen or natural born salesmen. There might be those people out there, but I know Gary Halbert's story from start to finish, and he didn't start out knowing how to sell. He was a guy who devoured every book he could find. He went and spent a week at the... Uh, uh, Congressional Library is—is is that the name of it? Uh, yeah, you see the Washington. picture I have up of you. Oh, pardon me. Look at the picture that I have up of you now. Where is the? Actually, I'm not seeing the uh, the thing. Hang on a sec. Why am I not seeing? It? I can't see the picture. You have to tell me what it is. Oh, it's you and Halbert in his place in uh, L.A. Um, he's wearing a straw hat and. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, he, he had to, um, you know, he, he had to work at it. Now he became one of the better salesmen. I think people have sometimes a natural inclination to tend towards sales because as Halbert said very famously, um, uh, everybody sells. 
if 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 you're married, you sold yourself on, on somebody to marry your sorry ass. If you're if you ever got the job you went after, you sold yourself in a, in an interview. Um, you probably sold yourself to teachers along the way who were going to give you a worse grade, and you know, and you got a better grade out of them. You sold yourself to the gang you hang out with. I mean, you're doing it all the time. Everyone does. We usually do it very poorly, or we do it kind of unconsciously. Professional salesmen kind of turn on the conscious elements of what it takes and start critically thinking about what works and what doesn't work. They'll say, "Wow, that worked," you know, so I'll try that again. Or they'll say, "Well, that didn't work," even though intuitively I thought it would work. You know, Harlan, I, I've told people in, in, in seminars for years, I told them, just try to convince a friend to go see a movie you've seen that you know they would like. Try to convince them to do that. Often, you'll discover that just the act of you telling them they should go see it and putting that enthusiasm of how much they'd love it and what a great time you had will ensure that they will never go. And it's because of the natural, inherent, hostile environment that is set up when you try to sell, when you when you put the screws to somebody and start pulling out the uh, pulling out what you think are all the stops. Persuasion is a very delicate operation. And you can get someone to go see you can get someone to go see a movie they wouldn't like uh, or they wouldn't ever go to uh, normally and you can trick them into going to it. Or maybe trick is the wrong is the wrong word. You can persuade them to do it. But you have to be conscious. You have to critically think about what will do it, and you have to operate from within their world, not the passion of your world. If you love a product or service and you're trying to sell it to somebody, and you know you're just hot about it, and you think it's great, and you think that by being loud and forceful and grabbing people by the lapels and shaking them, that you gotta have this. I demand that you do this. That doesn't work most of the time. Uh, what works is is getting inside of their head, finding out what they need, what the pain points are, what's keeping them up at night, connecting that to the benefits of this product or service, and you know completing that that process that that goes along. Now that so, takes me back to out to the first project that I had that I bugged you so much, and that's precisely the point that you um, not are you, are you talking about the golf the golf the ad golf ever? letter, and I mean some of your quotes were. Um, Harlan, uh, teaching you how to write golf is like trying to te teach a, a Doberman to pee in the backyard or, or something like <laughs> that. That was it. That was it. But the number one thing that you said was that I hadn't played any golf. I hadn't played any golf at all. And um, – you had me go out and I got a set of clubs and I went out and played golf and I started talking to golfers and that's when the copy started changing. Now, how much would you think that that my situation is, is typical that people don't really understand their market? Oh, easily a hundred percent. Um, I think that. And, and and a good copywriter. And and again, what are the what are the advantages of being a copywriter and, and becoming a successful copywriter? Whether or not you do it as a living, or or whether you do it occasionally as the owner of a biz, or whether you're the main guy that's making your biz run, when you start being successful, whether or not you realize it, you are applying what I call critical think, and that's a term yeah, I've you know, I've used, I'm probably writing a book about it, but it's it's critical thinking. It's looking at things and breaking it down into its parts and understanding why something worked, why a, why a certain pitch worked, why one letter worked or one email worked and another one didn't. And not just saying, you know, well, that didn't work, let's try something else, but figure out why didn't it work. What, what, what of the hundred moving parts and X factors in this thing did, you know, went wrong or, or, or went, went right. So by becoming automatically again sometimes it's unconscious with a lot of writers by becoming that that person who critically breaks stuff down and looks at all the elements or examines things or approaches things as a as a building up of something you know of, of creating a good sales pitch is an act of building things you know starting with a foundation building up from there you know step by step process uh, by understanding that you automatically start to uh, apply the empathy and the walking a mile in the other guy's shoes. That is essential to good salesmanship, whether it's in writing, in video, face to face, whatever. 
that you know that's why you know the uh, uh, they call it the salesman's Bible is uh, Dale Carnegie's old How to Win Friends and Influence People. As cheesy as that book is, and you know it's it, it's a quick read. You read it one evening, but you it used to be assigned reading to all sales staff. Uh, back in Madison Avenue days of the 50s, you know, the Mad Men days of the 50s and 60s and even, even before that. And it still should be. It is unjustly lost in the pantheon of books that people are reading. Just learn how to connect with somebody and operate from within their world, not your world. Because, again, you're not going to sell them by belligerently bludgeoning them from you know with your passion about this you've got to connect with their passion they're the ones going to open their wallet and take their their credit card out not John, you what what's an avatar and how do you use an avatar okay we're getting into the simple writing system stuff you know that's oh, that, that's my we'll, main we'll get there okay but that's my main breakdown the big breakthrough for me was Real, you know, as as I was working with guys like uh, uh, Jim Rutz, who invented the Magalog, uh, 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 Jay Abraham, who you also have worked with, and and Gary Halbert, and guys like this, I, I didn't just go work with them and glory in the you know, in the concept of you know, I'm now hanging out with the big guys, you know. I re I did it because I was a spy. I looked at everything they did. I examined what they did. I examined how they handled phone calls with people they liked, people they didn't like, people they wanted to sell, people they were trying to convince, people they were trying to get money out of. Maybe they owed them money. Things. There was a process going on, and I just kept breaking it all down. The avatar was a breakthrough. I used to just call it, you know, that guy. And and it was it was the moment when I realized I was, you know, my first few letters as a professional uh, freelance copywriter were for like the insurance uh, companies. And I was working with regular agencies in Los Angeles as a freelancer. And I, so I would write the kind of letter that you might get from a, an insurance agency pitching life insurance or something. So it's very general. And I had to write, I you know, I had to write in a way that that was kind of generic and 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 broadly covering everybody in the world who's going to do insurance and 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 later on when I started working with entrepreneurs who demanded more and more of the classic Claude Hopkins type of direct response I realized that you know having somebody to write to that guy or that girl um really helped me zero in on stuff and uh, it was like it was like bringing it all down to the idea that a letter a a a sales letter that goes out again whether it's online as a as a, a video sales letter whether it's written whether it's an email whether it's actually mail put in a newspaper or magazine or or whatever is really a salesman and a salesman operates one on one if he's talking to a bunch of people, he's still zeroing in on individuals there, and he's going to know who he's going to be able to flip and who he can't. And the ideal situation is that I call it the hushed conversation in the corner. And and the best kind of writing is where the reader thinks it's just you and him kind of sitting in the corner of a crowded room, leaning forward and talking in a low voice urgently about something. And if you've ever seen anybody do that or done that, you know you block out the rest of the world. You're leaning forward because you don't necessarily need anybody else to hear what you're talking about, and you're getting down to business. So the, the, the avatar, understanding that it's just you and one reader at a time, even though your sales letter or sales piece is going to be like a thousand of them cloned running out into the universe and, and trying to hit as many people as possible, it's still, each time it's read or each time it's heard, it's going to be just you and one person. And so... You know, and, and, and also understanding that, you know, in a, you know, in a list of 100 or 100,000 people, you're, you're not going to win them all over. You're going to go after the hottest part of that list, the ones that you can persuade, the ones that you can flip. And in a lot of businesses, you know, a 2 to, uh, you know, 8 or 10 percent, you know, flip rate is considered spectacular and hard to get. So you're, you, you, as you understand that, you're not writing to a, you know, the 100,000 people on the list. You're writing to a much smaller audience of people who are open to what you're, you're about to say who, or who can be persuaded to be open. And then it's just sentence by sentence, word by word, 
phrase by phrase as you work your way down that what we call the greased slide and it's just you and one other person go ahead start at the start taking them on that breathless ride where you're making sure they understand this is what you know this is the answer to their problem this is the solution this is going to be the the beginning of their new life all of these things that that uh, that make a uh, successful sales letter now okay so you have that information what are the first steps then they have? They know who the avatar is. Um, right. But let's go to the other end. How do they right. figure out how to how to formulate an offer? The other end. In other words, if you don't have an offer, yeah. if you don't ask for the money, uh, you know, your letter could be the best letter ever written. How do you ask um, for money? Well, you know, the, the way I put it is that, you know, even a rookie copywriter can get someone to the point where they say, you know what, that's a pretty good product. I think sometime down the line, you know, I'm, I'm going to buy that thing. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be ready to buy that in, in a while. Great job. Nice letter. Thanks for letting me know about this product. That's easy to do. You can teach someone to do that overnight. Getting to that point where the guy says, my God, I'm not letting you out of my sight until I get my hands on this thing. I need it now. What do I do? That is harder. That is knocking them off the fence. When they're on the fence, they're like, yeah, may buy, may not. I don't know. You know, some, sometime down the line. Knocking them off the fence is knocking them into, yeah, I'm in. What's next? So take, take them to, to that next step. So the offer is, and the offer, by the way, is the thing that separates the men from the boys. You know, the uh, there was that meme going around um, uh, for a while about selling without selling. There were people speaking at seminars and stuff. And, and what they were trying to get after is the idea that people feel icky actually forcefully trying to sell someone because they keep thinking of the guy in the plaid you know, jacket at the used car lot, you know, applying heavy duty pressure and making you feel dirty and, and insulting you and doing, pulling out all the evil tricks that some, you know, salesmen do. And they don't want to do that. And they want, they just want to present their case and have people realize how great it is and then buy. And that doesn't, it just doesn't work. It, you can't do that. You have to apply some kind of persuasion. You do not have to be that guy in the plaid jacket you know, uh, trying to bludgeon them in, into into selling or, you know, using, you know, uh, uh, really obnoxious tricks. You don't have to do that either. But the act of persuasion is a conscious act of putting yourself in the position of you are, you're, you have a goal and your goal is to get this person to flip, to pull out his credit card, to sign up, to join you to come to an event, whatever it is that you want, you are now on a mission. And that mission means, you, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's shame on you if you don't use everything in your, in your toolkit to get them to flip. Because if you have a good ethical product or service that they need that really can solve their problem, then what are you doing letting them off the hook? Because the natural inclination of people is not to buy, is not to not to be sold, is to you know is to think, well, maybe I'll do just a little bit more research, or you know, and you're actually doing people a favor if you have the answer, if you have that great product, and I hope everyone goes to hell if you don't have an, an ethical product. Um, and, and I say that at, at the beginning of uh, of Kick-Ass Copywriting Secrets, the first uh, uh, course course I wrote. That uh, you know this you know these tactics work for anything, but by God, I you know I I hope that you become one of the good marketers out there. So by doing that, you're doing your prospect a favor. Um, you're helping them to make the right decision. It's it sounds odd, but it's really true. Uh, how many times have have you? Uh, I I know that I have many times wanted to do something, and it could be. Call Susie for a date to the to the big dance coming up in high school, or it could be buy that that used car that fit all my needs, but I just wasn't sure it was the right car to get, and I I've been dreaming about that car the rest of my life, and I missed it, or that opportunity, or that seminar I should have gone to, you know, that I didn't because I wasn't sure the 500 bucks or whatever, you know, I I don't know, I don't want to go to the seminar. I mean, maybe there'll be a better one coming up, and that turns out to be the one that everything happened at. So 
if somebody had flipped me on that stuff, and I don't know what it would have took to do it. I actually had friends in high school who talked me into calling certain girls to get some dates. You know, they told me, yeah, you know, she'll say yes. So that took away all the all the, the grief and stuff. But I was being sold on making that that thing. So so you're actually help you are a facilitator of people's happiness and wealth and 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 better lives and all that stuff and it requires some skill and it requires you understanding uh, the essence of how to close how to open and close a sale does that make sense yes now let's follow up on this a lot of people especially rookies think that the factor in whether or not they make the sale is the price that are they charging too much and you know like hey, maybe I need to give it away. Um, yep. How big of a factor do you think price is in selling? Well, as you know, one of the first things that I have typically done <clears throat> over the course of my consulting career is one of the first things I often do with clients is get them to double their price. That, that usually makes them gasp and they're speechless for a little bit. It's just, we can't do that. We tried raising it by a dollar two years ago and it just you know freaked everybody out. No, you're... So many people, most people, the majority of people, undervalue uh, what it is they're bringing to the game. Uh, uh, you know, I help copywriters raise their uh, rates, you know, to to breathtaking levels because they're worth it. And once once I explain to them that they're not a vendor, they're not providing a, a Coke machine at their client's, you know, office. You know, they're providing the basis of everything that's going to be good in that client's life when the ad works and it's you know them paying you a lot of money is just a, a small down payment on the fortune that's about to to befall them as far as um, uh, people selling other kinds of products you have to get into that idea of what the what the value is and and you know people get caught up in money some of the best salesmen in the world aren't money motivated at all there the money is just a a one of the ways you keep score on whether you're doing okay or not it's just it's just points to consider and you figure you know the the best salesmen the best the happiest marketers are guys who are after something more they realize that money is just a tool to buy them more time more vacations better lifestyle bigger house maybe a smaller house maybe maybe uh, you know all kinds of things for me it's always been time so for me more money meant more time off. You know, when I was a freelancer, I used to routinely take three to six months off every year. I figured I was taking my retirement in installments back then. And once I became a guru, I had to I had to be available year round. But those were great times. All through the nineties, I took three to six months off every year and a couple of years off right in the middle of it and came back and was welcomed, you know, with open arms by the clients who were just waiting with bated breath for me to come back and write for them again. So that knowing that value, I went for higher royalties, for example, as opposed to just having them give me a check up front. I would just write for nothing, and when it won, I got a big chunk of the action. Um, for for people who are trying to price their regular products, um, again, it's like how much is something worth? You have to understand how capitalism works, how the the value of something surpasses any kind of assigned monetary uh, amount. You know, it's like this hamburger is worth, you know, like Carl's Jr. has a $6 burger. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. They, they came out with that almost ironically. It's the idea of nobody pays six bucks for a burger, you know, back then. Well, now people are paying a lot for, for burgers. But it was a bold move when they first came out. Now to get a Kobe beef burger in Las Vegas, you can pay fifty bucks. So it's you know it's it's a relative thing. And once you understand it's relative, then you start digging into why is it relative and what's relative about it and what are the x number of things that can be uh, can be changed, modified, or amplified to make it worthwhile so that people shell out fifty bucks for a burger while they're in Vegas. Does, it, does that answer the question? It answers the question. I want to go on to another area building right on top of that is the connection between a person's mindset and their pricing. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. Probably 
you know, I've run a major mastermind for for years now. In fact, uh, Harlan, you were a, the last guest. I was at the that. last one in San Francisco. Right. And what's interesting is that I get to see members and I get to see businessmen over a period of time. Now that I'm in, you know, grizzled veteran status, I get to look back and I've kept in touch with a lot of my former clients, even if I'm not still writing with them. I've, I've become friends with a lot of my colleagues and a lot of the people. So I get to see things happen over time. And it's not an anomaly that up to 50% of the consulting that I do over time involves personal stuff. Divorces, breakups with uh, business partners, somebody embezzling from you, uh, the human side of being in business that we all tend to for, forget about. So, you know, knowing that I have a, I have a degree, a, a BA in psychology. It's it's essentially worthless, but I've had a lifelong interest in psychology. Everything I, you know, I read Carl Jung obsessively. I've been involved with a, a number of different things. Even took Est back in the 70s. I mean, I, I just, I'm just interested in how people work and why they work the way they do and what's going on. So the mindset of anything you do, you know, I, I like to bring everything back to romance because people love it. That mindset of being on the phone as a teenager, you know, I distinctly, viscerally remember calling Susie Q for that first date, the first time I called a, a, a girl, really, you know, on the phone, you know, uh, I'm in high school, she's in high school, It's it's it was nerve-wracking, and I didn't understand, you know, but I remember it, because I had to get myself into that mindset to pull it off, because otherwise I'm just not going to do it. So we all tend to be, most people, except for the sociopaths among us, and that's a whole other conversation. And in most markets, you're going to be battling against competitors who are sociopaths to a degree, sometimes a great degree. So you have to understand the nature of the beast when you're competing. But it's, that's, a, that's a phone call in and of itself. Most people have trouble with mindset when they're outside of the comfort zone. And most people's comfort zone is sitting on the couch watching TV and not having a lot of anxiety about anything. So when you get into wanting something, making a plan to go after it, putting that plan into action, which requires pricing stuff, which requires positioning it in the market, which requires you putting yourself out there as an expert, all of these things take you way out of your comfort zone. And often you're lost. And so the mindset you have is not this unbending, I'm going to do this, and by God, that's the way it's going to be. The mindset of the true professional is is one of malleability. It's it's a uh, you can change with the wind. You 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 get as the input comes in, you change. As facts change, you change. You adapt to the situation at hand. That's 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 going on. So that mindset doesn't have to be this scary thing of, well, I'm going to charge a lot for this product and therefore I have to be that guy that I think I got to be to be the guy that asks for big money. No, you don't need to do that. You know, you, you will become that guy as you convince yourself and then convince others that your product is or service is worth the amount that you're going to charge. And when you're testing, you always want to test high prices and low prices. That's why I tell people to double their prices right off the bat. I get they off they won't do it. What they'll do is they'll test it and then they'll come back a year later and say you were right. But they almost never are able to just change, you know, change their mindset just like that. It's it's a process. It's a uh, 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 you know, it's like it's like trying on new clothes. It's like changing your, uh, you know, my, changing mindset is like changing your clothes. Just take all the clothes in your closet and throw them out, and stop wearing Levi's and T-shirts and tennis shoes or whatever it is your dress code froze at when you were in high school, and start wearing colorful, outlandish clothes. Dress like a pimp for a while, you know, and that's going to throw people way out of their comfort zone and that's that's how it is in business too when you're pricing yourself when you're putting yourself out there when you're when you're trying to build yourself your your credentials up to people who are going to pay you money to come in and do stuff as a freelancer or if if you've just got product online and you're up against a lot of competitors you have to position yourself in a certain way you know the the marketing graveyard is crammed to bursting with superior products of higher quality that no one figured out how to sell. And part of selling is pricing it and positioning it and and having someone, you know, come up and with the mindset of, you know, people are going to be better off with this one than with the competitors. So let's let's do what we need to do to do that. And that involves pricing. 
Okay, now let's go back to an area. I'm jumping around here, beginning to end, going back to the beginning. You've become known for headlines so powerful that uh, people are just aghast at your headline. They're like scrawling out from like the newspaper, magazine, or screen saying, you got to read this. Yeah. How do you come up with some of those beauties? You had you had the story, the well-known story, the one-legged golfer. You had the blind right. golfer. You had the guy who well, climbed well, out of his climbed, climbed out of his deathbed golfer. Um, yeah, I forgot about that one. Um, all of those are true. They're just they're just framed in a way that is unexpected or slightly out, outrageous, and that's my uh, you know the. Uh, the compelling the uh, uh, you call that the juxtaposition of opposites of of, uh, of compelling sales elements. It's the okay. it's the uh, incongruous. That's what it's the incongruous juxtaposition of compelling sales arguments. And what that means is that you know when I was interviewing the the guy about uh, the uh, you know just take the guy that crawled out out of his deathbed. Um, you know, I'm interviewing, I'm doing research, I'm going through the process of digging for hooks and clues and stuff that I can use that I, as a writer, hope will be semi-outrageous or breathtaking or at least eye-stopping, you know, as we call. And, and those stories are almost always stories that are the last to come out of the interviews. The guy, the, the guy I'm interviewing uh, never thinks that's important, certainly is an important part of the story. It's something his wife and his kids and his friends are tired of hearing about, and so he never even brings it up, and I have to keep digging. And the guy on his deathbed, as I recall, was just really was had this, I think it was a staph infection or something, <clears throat> but he actually made it to the, um, had made it into the, I think it was the Los Angeles uh, uh, Open. And you know he he made it you know he he actually actually did it so you know to him this wasn't a part of the story because it wasn't technically part of what he was selling, which was the swing he was talking about. For me, it was a big part of the story. It was part of his credentials. It was part of the of the drama of of the thing. It was part of you know the attitude about the love of of the game, the um, um, of all the things that go into being a golfer as opposed to say being a dog person or being someone who has no hobbies you know it, it's there's most people wander around in life without having anything they get really passionate about and that's a shame because th that's one of the sweet points of being alive is is having something um, of you know that you can really indulge in and be passionate about whether it's following the NBA and go Warriors but uh, or golf you know being you know just looking forward to that weekend golf game with the guys and uh, trying to get better, more respect off the tee all of these things come come into play and I've forgotten the question Harlan what was it essentially it was no it's uh, about coming up with these 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 headlines so so it's it's about being aware it's about living life large as we say and you know Harlan you're one of these guys I'm one of these guys most of our colleagues you know Kevin Rogers had a 10-year career as a stand-up comic uh, most of us even though we don't often realize it we've led large lives you know you routinely fly into a war zone <laughs> you know and, and uh, uh, there's there's a lot of things we do and we tend to take them for granted and most of the best writers I know not all of them but most of them you know, kind of chew up the scenery a lot in their private lives. Uh, you think of Clayton on his Harleys and, um, uh, you know, Halbert with endless stories of his large appetite for everything wonderful in life. And when you do that, you start to understand how other people may, you know, be secretive or quiet or, or actually ashamed of some parts of their life. I had to talk some of those guys into letting me use those hooks that I came up with because they really, you know, they, they were thinking, well, should I let people know about this? You know, is this something I should, you know, that's not part of being, you know, in polite society? Advertising is not part of polite society. You, you are in a position where you have to do what you need to do to get the person to do to get your prospect to do one of the hardest things it is to do, which is to take out your wallet and your credit card and actually buy something you didn't even know existed five minutes ago, and now suddenly you've been persuaded, you're moving, or maybe there's at a launch, it's a longer period where you're going over trying to make that decision, but that final decision of, yeah, I'm going to buy it, I'm in, that is, is a cathartic moment in a prospect's life. 
even for low price stuff, it doesn't even need to be a lot. It's like you finally decide what uh, transistor radio you're going to buy at Radio Shack, which dates me. They don't even exist anymore. But you're looking at five of them, and you have to come to a point. You have to, you know, is it the cheap one that you know is going to break down? Is it the expensive one that you're not sure about? Is it the one with better fidelity? What are you going to do? You know, all these X factors. And then the salesman comes along and says, oh, this is our best seller. This is the one. Where are you going to go? Oh, you're going to go to the beach. You want this one because the sand will get in, blah, blah, blah. Bang, you're done. You needed some some information. You weren't even sure what that information was. So, you know, moving through life and understanding all of the lessons that life has makes you a better salesman. And sales, you know, salesmen lead better lives. And I include copywriters and marketers in, in, in that. Uh, because you, you have to look at life in this real way of how people really act. Not how they say they're going to act, but how they actually act. They may promise you they'll buy, and we all know that if someone promises you're going to buy, but they just got a split and they'll be back tomorrow, they ain't coming back. They're going to talk themselves out of it. So, you know, knowing all of this stuff puts you in a better position to jump on the things that are going to move you now. And for me, it was a combination of following, you know, everything from the National Enquirer headlines that were shock value to the to just the things that uh, may not shock you, but at least get your attention. And your ad, in whatever form it is, whether it's email, video sales letter, just a uh, uh, real mailed letter or, or something in the magazine, it has to be the best thing your prospect reads today. It has to be the one thing that gets his blood going today because he's going to get pummeled with advertising all day long. He's going to get... You know, his, his, he wakes up and the first time he checks his email, you know, his, the inbox is stuffed with people wanting stuff from him, wanting to sell him stuff. So you got to stand out. You got to be that one thing he reads that really gets him moving. And to do that, you got to understand what motivates him, what interests him, what uh, you know, what charges his battery. Now, at, over the years, your copy has, seems to have gotten a lot more simple um, you got you you come to a very simple sales message boom 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 and not complex at all um, and and it seems to be working it seems you've made things just so much simpler for people can you talk about the simplification process where you basically will get up with somebody listen to what they've got to say and then you'll say, okay, this you have essentially four things here, and right. and you tell them exactly what to do. Um, Good observation, Harlan. That and that actually is the answer: is learning to break things down into their component parts. There is no such thing as a marketer with quote not enough sales unquote. You know, they they will come to you for consulting and say, I need more sales. Maybe. Maybe what you need to do is plug that leak that you don't even know about, or you need to realize that you're being embezzled, or you need to realize that you haven't done a back end in three years where all the real money is. So, you know, you may not need more sales. You may not need more people on your list. All the things that are keeping you up at night and you think you need may not be it at all. Maybe your uh, sales page on your website isn't working. You know, maybe, maybe the uh, you know all kinds of things can happen. So if if you start breaking it down to what is it that that you really need? What is the real problem? What's going on here? And being able to consult with people face to face, doing hot seats or even even you know being on the phone one on one with people and doing this, you get to understand how problems are presented, how problems are understood or misunderstood, and how a professional with much more experience, broad-based. I, I, you know, I love dealing with people in markets I've never written for or been in, because they think it's going to be unique. They think their problems are unique because it's a, it's an odd, offbeat market or something. There's nothing unique about it at all. In fact, the answers are often easier because they just never thought about their, you know, their their particular unique product or market in a broken down way down to the basic elements of human to human you know persuasion um, or the process of you know of handling the money and managing the business and customer support and all, all of that stuff. So I'm going to so, ask you about one of your clients and I, one of your former clients became a student uh, became one of your inner circle and how she got her start, and I'm talking about our good friend, 
Stacy Morgan Morgan Stern. Um, oh yeah. I know this is coming from left field, but sure. um, when Stacy got started, she was definitely what you would call not copy savvy. How did she get from where she was, not copy savvy, to being able to write some of the greatest copy for her niche and build a seven figure uh, business that's heading towards an eight figure business? You know, it's 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 a matter of um, she was somewhat successful. She she understood success, and she and I think she also understood that she wasn't tapping the the full the full monkey there. She wasn't. Uh, she wasn't doing all she could, so she got involved. Uh, was she in your class? Uh, no, she wasn't. But you, you, she got involved with your simple writing system. She joined the simple writing system. I don't even know how she found out about. It. We were doing an early session, and she became one of the uh, what we called a uh, case study because it was really interesting where she came from. Her background was like in music, you know, she's a big fan of Burning Man, you know, every summer and doing things, lives in San Francisco, and, you know, kind of a laissez-faire kind of person. And yet she understood that intuitively as we went through the process, and I remember, I remember uh, chiming in early on uh, because the simple writing system starts with talking about, you know, who you are and what you bring to the table, wh what, who your market is and what, you know, what they need, the, the avatar. Uh, and a lot of this research, a lot of the early parts of the simple writing system are explaining how to understand the, the playing field, how to understand what's going on before you write a single word of copy because when you get to the copy you've got to use all of these first steps which most people don't even know exist they they don't understand what it means to research a market to understand the the uh, visceral needs of the avatar of of the prospect that that you're going after to to learn how to position yourself and your product in the market against all of the forces acting against you, the competition, the general uh, laziness of your audience, the difficulty in reaching them, you know, th through all the noise, all of this stuff. And then, so when you sit down to write, you're actually, you know, she was in a position where she could just, you know, she needed to have a clear path to be able to communicate what was just burning inside of her. And she didn't have that clear path. It's like trying to talk to somebody you can't, can't catch up with. You're in that dream where you're slogging through mud and they're always just half a block ahead of you and you're trying to reach them. By going into the simple writing system, it just, I remember she was on lesson three or four when it just dawned on her early in the program. You know, there's 17 steps in the in the uh, uh, simple writing system and, and in step three or four, maybe five, it just all became crystal clear and that sense of slogging in mud always being behind just vanished and she became on, on a, she was able to run, catch up and then she didn't have much trouble being able to tell the person what they needed to hear to come on board with her. She was a spectacular uh, success story and I actually had her be a, a special guest in my mastermind uh, a couple of years ago. She, she just shined. I mean, it's just wonderful to see people go from that sense of, and, and she's a perfect example of somebody who's good-hearted, ethical, great product, just doesn't know how to sell it, and really headed for the marketing graveyard uh, as, as her, her business if she didn't learn how to do that. So in a bit of a desperate situation. So having just those basic essentials, basic to guys like you and me, but a total freaking mystery to the average marketer or entrepreneur out there who isn't schooled, who hasn't been able to sit down with a uh, copywriter or a marketing expert and and have the steps explained and 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 be coached as you go through them and have your your uh, what we call you know bullshit uh, belief systems blasted away. Most people, you know, Harlan, you've been a teacher in uh, what five of these uh, simple writing system uh, classes, and you know, often it's it's knocking away the belief systems that are holding people back. They think it can't be that way, it can't be that easy, or it can't be that hard, or it can't be that I need to, you know, that I need to do this. You know, I know how to be empathetic. They will say, well, no, actually, you don't, because you're not being empathetic here. You're trying to bludgeon your prospect, clearing up those basic things, bringing them down to zero, 
so that you get rid of the belief systems of how people think things are sold, how people think businesses should be run, how people think pro prospects should react to your you know, brilliant, cute, darling headline and, and, and copy, and getting down to the reality of what things are, of what's really going on in the prospect's head, of what's really going to sell this, of what, the, what a good price is, what the real value is, all this stuff. It's it's transformative to people who are who, when that is the thing keeping them away from being massively successful and 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 having their dreams come true. It, it there's no magic involved. Don't wait for the white guy on the white horse to come and save you. Don't wait for somebody to come up with a magic headline that's going to work and stuff. That isn't how it works. It's much more break it down, figure it out. And you know, in the simple writing system, it's all kind of laid in, laid on a silver uh, uh, plate for you, and it's like, oh, do this, then do this, then do this, then do that, and then things just naturally start clicking into place. It's so easy when you go step by step, and you know what the next step is, and the next step is going to be just as easy as the one before it. But because you're going in that manner, it's 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 a simple methodical process you can repeat over and over and over again. And Stacy is just, you know, just I smiled when when you said her name. I knew you were going to talk about her just when you started describing her. It's just, you know, what a, what a wonderful thing to happen to a wonderful person with a wonderful product, you know, and making so many people happy and being rewarded for it. That's 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 huge. Now what the most amazing thing is that she is in a niche that you would not, that not me, not you, that most people would assume right. is not a niche that has money in it. Yep. And she's like pulling money out of that niche with, with buckets. She's got everything yeah. set up. It's a science and they just rerun it again and again and again. And ultimately, they get them into uh, the first level after they, you know, get them in the door and get them to some uh, seminars is a $6,000 coaching group. And then it goes beyond that as well. And the sky is the limit for them. Right. And and very, very happy customers. And, you know, that's that's a good, you know, you we talk about markets that aren't perceived as, as being viable because they've, you know, they don't seem to have the money that the uh, glamour uh, uh, markets have, that the the markets most people go after. You know, most people when they become entrepreneurs, they don't have an idea of what to sell, so they become an entrepreneur first, rather than having a great product or biz idea and then becoming an entrepreneur to make it real. A lot of people come into being an entrepreneur because they they, they want to work for themselves and stuff, and they will gravitate towards markets like diets and. Uh, things like that where everybody else is going it's like you know okay I, I understand that but you gotta understand the the biggest most well-funded with huge resources sociopaths out there are also in that market you're swimming with sharks so a lot of times being in the more modest markets and and serving them the you know serving the underserved markets in a way that they've been hungering for possibly silently for a long time is the way to go. You know, Harlan, you, you and I used to talk uh, back in the early days when we were young and vibrant. You know about the low hanging fruit online. There were markets when in 2004 that nobody was in. There were no entrepreneurs online selling easy information to people in certain markets, and they were all over the place. They got gobbled up quickly. But for a while there, it was. It was like landing on an island, you know, stacked knee deep in golden coins, and uh, that's all changed now. So you you have to adapt. You have to you have to uh, realize there's more competition out there, and uh, uh, you know you need to do the things to establish yourself to understand what you're doing and have, as you said with Stacy stuff, a solid, repeatable, um, uh, uh, adaptable system. To go after the people, provide the, the services you know of high value, and be rewarded for that by people paying. Now, you talking about repeatable systems? You've created the simple writing system. Um, a couple of things about it that I'm going to say, and then let you comment, is that in programs that are sold on the internet, you probably have the highest completion rate of any program that's out there. 
Uh, Wait, um, are you scooping hold ice? Hold on a second. Not Sandra, could you, like, <laughs> hold on on that? Or John is going to get you, okay? <laughs> that was pretty funny. <laughs> you, know, you know Sandra. She's been with me for, oh, yeah. for years. So um, the um, you have the highest completion rate of, of any program that's out there on the net. You know, a lot of programs – People join, and then that's the last time yeah. they do anything. Maybe they don't even bother logging in. Okay, right. they just buy it. Why is the simple writing system so successful in getting you people know, to I, actually do it? Well, I would have to say it was set up. It, the, the actual uh, naked, the actual structure of the thing was done by my business partner, Stan Dahl. And, and the genius behind that is setting up virtual classrooms that allow the teacher to easily interact personally with every single student to, to do it in a way where everyone else gets to see what's going on. So everyone's learning from, from whatever actions you're taking. It's very easy. It's, it's not time consuming at all. So it's very simple, but it's extremely powerful. That kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching requires a platform of easy back and forth uh, interactive, um, you know, th that personal touch, and, and Stan was able to do that, and it's fun. You know, he's he, the, the idea of the virtual campus, you know, there's a student lounge in there, the online, stu where the students hang out with each other, and friendships, you know, for life are made in there. The uh, teachers have a, a teacher's lounge, so the teachers, where the students can't, can't go in, and and you know we formed huge bonds as as colleagues and professionals there. I mean, a, a business gets done, all kinds of things. It's a win-win situation, and the customer support that Stan has engendered is astonishing. There, there are people that uh, understand what's going on, un understand the mindset, Harlan, of somebody coming into a situation like this, being in those virtual classrooms, having this step-by-step -step process, and all of the natural human resistance to going through it, to the, the second thoughts, the feelings of being a little lost. You know, all of us remember stepping for the first time on that high school campus or, or maybe you, you were one of those people who had to change uh, schools a lot or something. That being the new kid or, or walking into a new environment is is daunting. And even as adults, it continues to be daunting. You know, walking into, you know, for pe first time seminar you know, uh, uh, folks, you know, go through that. They have flashbacks to the trauma of, you know, stepping on campus, you know, in a, at a new high school when they step into the room. And that's why savvy people take care of that. They they make ways to make you comfortable. Uh, they make, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of customer support to make sure that, that all of your questions are answered, that you're feeling like you are as ready as as humanly possible to take the next step to get to get into the program to actually participate in in the back and forth and the teachers are just over the top great people I mean all top copywriters now, that is one must... of the amazing things that you've gotten people in there who are full time copywriters you got right. people like David Deutsch who is certainly considered to be one of the top copywriters alive with dozens of controls out there who's a freaking genius and he's in there working with people uh, you got a million dollar Mike Morgan who is busting yep. out controls at Agora Financial he's yep. he's in there you've got um, people I don't know Dark if you're show up this time you got like L Leah Carson uh, Princess right. Leah we call her um, who yeah. just got a control up at, at uh, Boardroom uh, Jim Curley, someone who has worked with you for ages and ages in the uh, golf business and has an uncanny view on uh, on VSLs and expertise in that area, and and on and on and on, uh, you've got the top people in there, and then when they're on a particular lesson, you're in every single classroom almost every day. Um, yeah, I'm commenting and, and adding and, and whatever, and, uh, and, and other teachers go into other classrooms and comment as well. It's like the best of every single world.
it's almost too good to be true. It's hard for people to understand, you know, the you know the idea of, you know, most people, most entrepreneurs are never going to be in a room sitting around with top copywriters, being able to ask them anything and have their full, undivided, focused attention. This is a way to do that. Yes, it's virtual, it's online, but, uh, you know, if you ever do meet them. What they do, John, is they work on a letter for their own business, right? They don't, you know, Yeah, well, the, the, the... the the process yes you don't you know we don't actually encourage them to have a finished letter when they're done because it doesn't matter the letter doesn't matter the process is what's ma- is what what matters so when they're when they're through with their mentoring they can write anything they need if they need to write five you know um, uh, auto uh, responder emails you know it, it, you know in one night they can do it and they know and they're going to be good and they know what needs to go into it if they need to have a big uh, VSL ready for a launch. They know what needs to go into it. They know how to pull it off. If they need an ad that's going to run or they want to get into direct mail, they know how it all gets done because they've hung out with the best in the biz. And all teachers hunger to teach. Uh, you know that. You you actually taught before you became became a copywriter. It It is rewarding, and that's how we're able to get these top guys in there. It is my unique position of having been colleagues. I've known David Deutsch since 1989. I've known Jim Curley almost as long. I've known a lot of these guys uh, for decades, and I'm not calling in favors. I just I say here's a chance to teach. It's in this format, which they all know works really well. Doesn't take a lot of time. Is incredibly rewarding for the teacher as it is transformative for the student. So they, um, you know, they they readily do it. Uh, I think all of the teachers here are vet. Yes, there. Are, I think all the teachers are veteran teachers this time who have been in at least three or four of the simple writing system uh, uh, classes that we've offered and we only offer once a year so this this you know these are people who have been doing this for a long time who really no. understand the process it's not are even totally once, bought in it's not even once a year john you know it's I sometimes class was almost a year ago yeah um there there sometimes it's even further apart i mean yeah the one before that was like 3 years yes yeah you're absolutely right this is a very very occasional thing right now. Um, right. That's why I'm going to urge people. There's a link. Um, I put it in the chat. It's killstein.com forward slash Carlton. And you'll come to an opportunity to join John Simple Writing System. There are videos. There are uh, loose leaf books. You get uh, sample ads which illustrate every element of the course. And then you get this online classroom where you go to work and you can be assigned or you can choose to be in my classroom. It's it's really up up to you um, and work with just legends on and work on your stuff. And my experience, uh, basically because I keep people focused, is that most of my people actually finish. We go beyond, uh, but most of my people actually finish a letter for their business, um, and it's like all of the steps wrapped up to it, and sometimes they have to scramble at the end to finish. Nothing like a deadline to get people going, (laughs) but, um, but it's rare when people do not finish, you know, because the course is just that simple. Um. Folks, I can't, I, I can't, um, uh, John said that we would have an hour. Um, we're coming up on the hour, but I want to tell you that the simple writing system is absolutely the best way from someone to go from I don't know how to write copy to writing copy that commands respect and dollars. Uh, John's copy, Learning with John, has made me over my career millions and millions and millions of dollars. We know that there are people who have taken this course who have gone on to generate seven or eight figure businesses. The stuff just works. I don't need to use 
even a single ounce of hype here. Uh, the, 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 the cart is open right now, and it's closing when? Uh, a couple of days. Okay, so it's um, not long, and then you're immediately, no, not long at all. immediately admitted into the classroom where you'll get to work with, um, with some of the best pros in the world of copy who come together once every year, once every other year, and just focus on, um, on getting you to the next level. This is yeah. for your business. Whatever you want to do, the simple writing system will will get you there and get you there quickly. Last word for John. I'm going to hold on myself to the time limit. Um, the uh, classes start next week. Uh, the people that have gone through this, we have a, a large number of people who take it over again. They had so much fun, and they realized the value beyond just learning how to write everything they needed to write was just hanging out with these top writers to be part of the inside group for once in their lives, to really have a, uh, a, a fun uh, environment of learning, of, 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 of hearing the, the voice of experience, of getting to be a, in the deep you know, inner chambers of the uh, marketing and advertising world. It's it's just it's it's a treat. It it's uh, is enjoyable, and you come out of it uh, the other side completely transformed into somebody with the kind of chops that others will pay you to uh, to uh, lend to them. So you can you know it, even if you've never written for anyone else, you can do it now. A lot of marketers become so good at their own stuff for their own product that other uh, marketers come to them, beg them to work their magic uh, for them. And it's not magic. It's a step-by-step -step process. It's very simple. It's a system. It's everything you need to just be off to the races for the rest of your days. And, that's, and, and I can't recommend Harland enough as, as a teacher. He's always uh, uh, gotten uh, some of the highest marks after after the uh, uh, sessions for for teachers, and uh, he's a great guy, a good friend of mine, and um, I I thought this was a great call, Harlan. You really uh, got me to talk about stuff I haven't talked about in a long time, so that was good. We have a question here. Brian wants to know, so we can specifically choose Harlan as a teacher. Yes, I think if you come in under my link, they'll put you in there, but you can request anyone, and within. Uh, reason I, I you know I can't think of a single request that they haven't honored so yeah I, I, I leave that up to Stan you you can uh, uh, you know there's there's no harm harm in asking uh, teachers do have limits to the classroom that's the other thing these are these are very limited classrooms I think the most anybody's had has been 20 students and the average is a dozen or so so you, you know you you're not in a crowd you're not like a voice lost in the wilderness this is personal, this is intimate, this is, you know, you and a top writer, um, and you have, uh, you know, you can peek into other people's classrooms and see what's going on in there, so you can go see what Deutsch is doing, what Garfinkel's doing with his kids. Um, oh, gosh, David Garfinkel, one of my teachers, he is great in there. Um, Okay. Yeah, so he's one of the best. Vicky's asking a really great question. Are these classes in the evening for any of us with full-time jobs? And the answer is, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're whenever you want to take them, Vicky. Um, the copywriters um, respond to you doing your assignments, and every copywriter is typically in their classroom every single day. And as a matter of fact, if someone's going to be away, we go into our teacher's lounge and say, hey, it's my kid. I got my kid's graduation coming up one day. Um, I might be a little slow to respond that night because can someone look in after my students? And, and you, go, you know, when someone puts out something like that, like you get four copywriters say, OK, I'll look out. So sometimes it's a treat when we go away. Um, yeah. And um, there's always oh, oh. someone there. 
Yeah, and 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 that's one of the uh, you, a lot of these questions will be answered on the uh, page that that Harlan is 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 sending you to. It's uh, we we've done this multiple times. I believe this is the twelfth time we've offered this over the years. I believe. Um, and we uh, we understand what most bother or you know is on people's minds before they actually d decide to join. And this 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 is self-directed. You're not punished. You don't have to keep up with anything. You go at your own pace. So if you want to do everything at the last minute, that's fine. If you want to go through half the course and that does it for you, like I said, Stacy went through about a third of the course before it really dawned. I think she finished the course, but. The big breakthrough was happened in the first five uh, uh, lessons. Um, you, yeah, that reminds, uh, me of a, reminds me of a story of a guy who bought a day with Jay Abraham that included uh -huh. four hours of Jay. And um, he sat and talked with Jay. And then after like 90 minutes, he got up and thanked Jay for his time. And Jay goes like, what about the rest of the time? He goes, oh, I got enough already. Um, so you <laughs> never know. Guy, yeah. You never yeah, but, know. But, but again, we, this is a global classroom, so we have people in different time zones. Uh, there's always a lot of Australians, uh, people in the uh, – uh, we have people from Japan. We have people who, for whom English is a second language or third language. We have uh, entrepreneurs from all over the world. So it's, it's you know, the, the thing – the classrooms are open 24-7. For, for the length of the uh, of the uh, session, and uh, you can chime in anytime and or not chime in at all. There's no pressure to you. No, there's there's no um, there's no commitment other than what you do yourself. That's actually one of the main lessons. Is this is self driven? And by the way, as far as time commitment, if you drop one uh, half hour or hour TV program you've been watching over the years weekly, just one TV program jettisoned and you're watching too much TV anyway that gives you more than enough time to take care of everything you need to take care of to get go through the entire process so this is not time consuming at all and it's not you know the idea of evening classes and things it's just the classrooms are there the teachers are there they're available they're paying attention they're focused when you want to interact that's when the interaction happens uh, the teacher will get back in there see your response it'll go back and forth it's very fun. Well, John, the, the, I'm telling you, one of the one of the best things that you've ever created, the simple writing system. Go over right now to killsteen.com forward slash Carlton. Um, someone asked me, is there going to be a replay? Uh, as they say, good Lord willing and uh, go to webinar <laughs> um, providing. Uh, we'll see if we can yeah. get that up and ready um, for you. But whether you webinar or not, or replay or not, go over and check out what John's got for you. And um, you guys know, I don't advertise, recommend a lot of stuff. And Simple Writing System, I clear my schedule for it because it's that good. Anyway, guys, go in there, take a look at it if it's for you. I think it's pathetically underpriced. Uh, for the value that you get. So go over there and check it out. John, thanks for being here, um, and and we'll we'll see you on the inside. Yeah, Harlan, I look forward to seeing you again real soon, pal. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.